2 Kings this morning, chapter number 19. 2 Kings chapter 19. It has been in my heart for several, several weeks as the Lord would give me liberty to preach messages that deal with prayer. Most of our messages have been dealing with prayer on an individual basis for God to help us and strengthen us. But this morning, I want to preach to you about a king named Hezekiah, a godly king, a man of God, who got under a burden for a nation that had gone astray. And God used this man to bring a space of repentance and revival to a nation that needed it. Hezekiah poured out his soul unto God, and God heard and answered his prayer. And I want to say this morning that God still answers prayer. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man still avails much. The power and the majesty of God are not bound or limited. God can do exceeding, abundant, above all that we ask or think. And it's no big thing for God to do something big. It's no big thing for God to step out in a time of chaos and do for us what we could never in a million worlds do for ourselves. Hezekiah in our text this morning came to the realization that if he did not pray and get a hold of God, that him, his nation, his family, their heritage had no hope of survival whatsoever at all. And may I sound to you an alarm this morning if we who know Jesus don't really pray and get a hold of God in our generation, our family, our nation, our heritage as we know it will be engulfed by an enemy who has no fear of God, who has no concept of God. And I'm telling you tonight, when you don't fear God and have no respect for God, you don't fear his people and respect his church. And sad to say, there's always been, not just this morning, but there's always been evil powers that have tried to stamp out God, God's name, and God's people. But if you are a student of history, not just the Bible, you know this with conviction. The light may get dim and the flame may flicker and there may be hundreds of years in history and it looks like the church, God's people, have been snuffed out. But read the rest of the story. In a dark hour, God, Lord have mercy, rolls up his sleeves and answers the prayers of his people. And who knoweth whether this morning that we're living in an area where the events are being arranged by a sovereign, providential God to put the church back on its knees again in total dependence upon God. If you are a student of church history and biblical history, you'll find the church moves farther when it's on its knees than when it does on its feet. And someone said, don't you think it's time to take a stand? Well, we didn't give up that part. Now it's time to get on our knees and beg God for mercy and a divine intervention. Any religious leader that wants to stand and say that a man is a sinner because he wants to build a wall, ought to stand and say a man that believes in killing little babies and same-sex marriage, to me that's the real sinner and that's a man that's really not a Christian. 
I am not here to promote a political candidate and I'm not here to make fun of a religious leader. I'm just saying, well, you know what you're talking about. Keep your stinking mouth shut. Furthermore, if you're not a tax-paying citizen of this country, it ain't none of your business anyway. And if you really want to talk about killing and being mean and who's a real Christian, study the Inquisition and the Dark Ages and you'll find out that a lot of people say things they don't mean themselves. Can I get a witness in the church? And we're living in a society when it seems like the enemy has more voices than the salt and the light. I want to say this. Christian people that really believe the Bible, we may never, ever again have a voice in the courthouse or the White House. But we that are saved have a power and a voice and a strength that goes way beyond Pennsylvania Avenue. It goes way beyond the court. It goes way beyond the White House. We have a name. We have a power. We have a victory. We have a hope. And it is in Jehovah God. And his name is Jesus Christ. I'm about to enjoy my introduction. And he still answers prayer. Lord of mercy. Man, King Hezekiah, now listen, King Hezekiah was not an old fogey. King Hezekiah, because he believed in God, was not an old fogey. I resent the world looking at people that believe in God as being ignorant and old fogies. Brother, I am not an old fogey. The fire still burns in my soul. In fact, the fire so burns in my soul, it burnt the hair off the top of my head. Say amen right there. But because I believe in God, does it mean I'm an old fogey? And I'm going to tell you something, yes, because we believe in God and believe in the sanctity of life and marriage, that doesn't believe we're ignorant. That believes we believe God, we know our Bible. And old King Hezekiah was not some old fogey. He was a 25-year-old man. And I want every one of you young people to listen to me. His daddy was wicked. His daddy was ungodly. His daddy was one of the most wicked kings that Israel ever had. But that boy made a choice not to follow in the footsteps of a wicked daddy and give his heart to God. And that little 25-year-old king comes to power and a matter of days, revival takes place, restoration takes place. The heathen gods go out of business. The heathen temples go out of business. And once again in the holy land, praises ring to the name of Jehovah God. I'm telling you, God is able to raise up a young man man or a young woman in this room this morning and give you a hunger for God and a thirst for God and God can so empower you and anoint you. You can make a difference in the world in which you live. This 25 year old king gets hunger for God. Man, God sends a measure of revival. And just like every time somebody gets hunger for God and God goes to using them, oh, the devil gets mad. And I just say this, one of the greatest signs you're living for God is the devil stays mad at you. And I'm going to tell you one reason why the devil hates America. There's never been a nation in the history of the world that has given more money to feed a hungry and hurting people like the good old United States of America. You let a tsunami come, you let an earthquake come, you let a disaster come, who's there first with money, food, heart, and hand and help? Yes, sir, the good old USA. And by the way, it must be something good around here because the whole world wants to come here. I'll tell you why they want to come here. They done messed up where they live and they ain't got no choice and they know there's still freedom in this country and food in this country and hope in this country and I'm glad there's still a God in this country and I'm glad there's still people in this country that know that God and fear that God and want to serve that God. No other nation in the history of the world has not only given more money but sent more of its own people all over the world to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
and no other nation in the history of the world has stood with God's chosen nation, Israel, like the United States of America. And I believe that's why the devil in the last hundred years has tried to do everything he can to stop America and silence America and depower America because he knows we give to the needy, we give to the poor, we want to win the lost, and we love Israel, and that's why the devil hates us that way. And by the way, the moment you sign the dotted line that is for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Satan is going to get mad. The devil's going to get mad. Hell is going to get get mad, but you remember this, serving God is not without conflict. It is a warfare, and ladies and gentlemen, this morning, there are some things ought to be worth fighting for at your house, in my house, and in our hearts, and in our heritage. And by the way, this book that I hold in my hand, this church building that I stand in to preach, and my precious family is worth standing and fighting and begging God for revival, for survival. Man, Hezekiah has enraged the enemy. They have sent him a letter saying, boy, we're going to put you out of business. We're going to wipe you off of the map like we have all of these other countries. And notice the letter said, and they're little G gods. But what they don't know, they're picking on an old boy. They don't have a little G God. They're about to pick a fight with a little fella that's got a big G God who's not a statue, who's not a shrine who is not a figment of the imagination but is holy and real and personal and sovereign and divine and this old boy is about to pray. This old wicked king, I love this, is going to get the whipping of his life not through the hands of a military power. Hezekiah and his soldiers never lift a finger. This wicked king is about to get the whipping of his life. Well, don't you like the way we say that down south? The whipping of his life. He is not going to get a spanking. He's going to get a whooping. You say, what is the difference? If you don't know, you've never had either one. But this wicked king is about to get the whipping of his life. Not through a sword, not through a spear, not through 300,000 allies, but this wicked king is about to get the whipping of his life because a 25-year-old boy is going to get on his knees in the house of God and call on God. This little 25-year-old king is going to hang his hope on the power of the Almighty. And when the sun comes up in the morning, this wicked king has not been defeated by might nor by power, but by a little saint of God that touched heaven on his knees in prayer where God still answers prayer. Man, I want to preach right here. I want to say this, thank God for everything that God's given us, but there is no weapon known to mankind any more powerful and strategic than the power of a blood-washed, Holy Ghost-filled Redeemer down on our knees crying out to a God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Man, let's read the text. 2 Kings chapter number 19, begin reading in verse number 14. Here is what King Hezekiah did with the threatening letter that he received. And Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah, say this out loud with me, went up into the house of the Lord. I'm glad we know where to go, buddy. When the trouble comes in our life, that ain't when we lay out of the house of God. That's when we run to the house of God. He went to the house of God, the house of the Lord, and spread it, the open letter, before the Lord. Now listen to this. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, I love it, O Lord God of Israel, which dwelleth between the cherubims, 
Thou art the God. Can I say that out loud with me? Thou art the God. Say that one more time. Thou art the God. Boy, listen to this phrase. Say it out loud with me. Even thou alone. And I tell you, there's nothing wrong with believing in one faith, one Lord, one God, and one gospel because there's only one. Only one real, true, eternal, everlasting God, just one. And there's nobody like him. Thou art the God, even thou alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which hath set a reproach to the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands and have cast their, notice, little g gods into the fire. For they were no gods, but the works of men's hands and wood and stone. Therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord, Say it with me, our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand that all of the kings of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even, say it with me, even thou only. And for the sake of time, come down to verse number 35, here is a prayer that got an immediate answer. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote, I love it, and smote in the camp of the Assyrian a hundred and four score and five thousand. That's a hundred and eighty-five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Here is a man that got a whipping of his life because somebody got a hold of God. Can I say God has no respect for a person? And if Hezekiah can get a hold of God, I believe there's somebody in this room this morning that can get a hold of God. And can I remind you that God that answered the prayer of Hezekiah is the same God that can answer your prayer and mine when we pray in the name of Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. Quickly this morning, let me give you three things in the text about this prayer that got an answer. Number one, quickly, I want you to notice the threat from the enemy. The threat from the enemy. When you go home this afternoon, turn to that chapter 19 and read the first 14 verses and you'll find in this letter that this wicked king sent this young man was a letter that threatened everything that was dear and precious to Hezekiah. In that letter, here's the threat. Number one, your nation and all of your fruit and all of your foundations are going to be destroyed and burned with fire. Threat number two, your confidence and the faith that you have in God is going to be destroyed. Number three, the faith and the trust you have in your pastor. And by the way, Hezekiah had a wonderful pastor. His name was Brother Isaiah. What a preacher man. Can you imagine having old Brother Isaiah as your pastor? I mean the one that saw the virgin birth, the one that saw his sacrificial death, the one that saw his second coming, the one that saw the glory of the Lord had filled the earth. That was his pastor. But that threat said, by the time I get through with you, you'll not only have no faith in God, but you'll have no confidence in your religious leaders. 
We're going to come and destroy you. We're going to kill your families. We're going to kill your children. And those who escape the edge of the sword will become his servants. And there be no Jehovah. And there will be no temple. And there will be no tabernacle. And you won't believe in God. You won't be able to trust this preacher nor any word that God says. That was the threat. And you know what? Old brother Hezekiah didn't stick his head in the sand and hope the booger man would go away. He realized that threat. He addressed that threat. He stood up to that threat and he took that threat and he took it to God and he bathed it in prayer. You say, Pastor, what has that got to do with us? Sad to tell you, we're living in the last days and our family and our faith and our freedoms and our future are being threatened on the horizon. The farther we go in these last days, the bigger that threat is going to get. Can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the church has enemies this morning. You say, Pastor, are you going to preach another one of those politically charged sermons? No, I'm just going to tell you like it is because somebody needs to stand up and tell the church we got to get our head out of the sand and we got to quit playing with God. There's a real enemy out there that wants our country and it wants our children and it wants our faith and it wants our Bibles. And brother, listen to me. Don't believe these weird signs on the bumpers of these cars coexist they don't want to coexist. They want the church gone. They want the Bible gone. They want the standard gone. I want to say one day they're going to get their wish. The saints of God will be raptured out and then they can have it. But until then, it's time to get on our knees and stand our ground and say, hold it right there. How many of you love your Bible this morning? Wave it. How many love your family this morning? How many of you love the religious freedom that we've had in our country? Not just religious freedom, but financial freedom, economical freedom. Something's wrong in a society that rewards the lazy and punishes the rich. You cannot survive in a nation like that. Boy, this wicked king gets a letter and he writes all of his threats Everything you love is going. Everything you know is going to be destroyed. Your nation's going to be destroyed. Your family's going to be destroyed. You'll have no future. And you can't believe in your God. You can't trust in your God. You can't believe anything his preacher says. Just cast it all away. Throw all the standards away. Throw all your morals away. You might as well forget it. We're coming. And that is the threat. Can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the threat it's higher than it's ever been and it's more real than it's ever been and the problem is we have raised a generation that's been pampered and babied and pampered and babied and they're so babed in ignorance they don't even see the threat that you and I see just because we know God and believe the Bible. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I believe we ought to do our Christian duties. I believe we ought to do our Christian duties and show up and vote. But we're going to have to have something besides of a vote. We're going to have to have somebody get on their knees and call on the mighty God of heaven for divine intervention. You say, preacher, you trying to alarm us. Oh, I wished I could. There are some people in this room this morning that play with your Bible and you play with church and you play with God and you play with Christianity. I wish I could scare you to get you to be faithful to God and faithful to your family and faithful to your Bible. There are some folks I wish I could shake out of their shoes and say, do you realize we're losing our freedoms? We're losing our nation. We're losing our heritage. We're not, listen, listen, the threat is this. It's not being taken from us, buddy, we're fooling around and giving it away. And I had several people comment to me both, both positively and negatively of a comment I made a few Sundays ago since it was so popular, I think I'll make it again. If you will not live for God in religious freedom, you're sure not gonna live for God in the midst of religious persecution. 
Son, if you don't go to church when you got the freedom to do that and you don't pray and read your Bible when you got the freedom to do that, when they lay a gun to your head and say, we'll shoot you if you go, you sure won't go then. The threat is real and the threat's not going away. And you listen to me. There's no power in Washington that can stop that threat. There's no military power that can stop that threat. But I want you to look up this morning to the third heaven. There is a God and his name is Jehovah and he's got a son named Jesus and he's never lost his authority and he's never lost its power and he can only stop the threat. He can put the enemy on the run because he's God. He's still God and he always will be God. And we have at our disposal the power of prayer. I want you to see the threat from the enemy. Number two, here's what I want to preach a while. I want you to see the travail with the eternal. The travail with the eternal. I see King Hezekiah. He opens that letter. It's doom and gloom from the top to the bottom. And I can hear one of the king's aides say, King, what are you going to do with that? Mr. King, what are you going to do with that? He binds up that letter and says, watch what I'm going to do with it. Are you going to another judge court? Are you going to take it to court? Are you going to a political meeting? He said, no, watch what I'm going to do with the threat. He bound up that letter and they said, where are you going, King Hezekiah? He said, watch me. I'm going to the house of the Lord. He said, I'm going to where God's people pray, God's people sing, and God's people worship. I'm going to the house of the Lord. I want to say that's a good place to go. That's a good place to go on Sunday morning. That's a good place to go on Sunday night. That's a good place to go on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. You can't go to church too much. Don't you just love these people who know all about the Bible and they all about Christianity and they claim to be close to God and they don't have a relationship with the church? Let me tell you something, brother. The Bible said unto him be glory in the church. Your family needs this church. Your children needs this church. Our counties and our cities need this church where the hand of God is and the praise of God is and the name of God is. I'm glad there are still some places you can go and pull your feet into the the table of God and worship God in spirit and in truth. He goes to the house of the Lord. And I see one of his aides say, King Hezekiah, what are you going to do when you get there? He said, I'm going to read this letter to God. He said, don't you know God already? He said, I know God already knows. I'm going to read this letter to God. Boy, he lays that letter out there and he said, God, I want to read you something. This is what they've said. They've not only said it against me, but God... They've said it against you. God, they said in that letter that I couldn't depend on you. God, they said in that letter that you've lied to me. God, they've said in that letter that you and your preacher man off the deep end, God, they've said to me, all hope is gone. And God, I just want you to read what's in this letter. Lord, I want you to do three things for me. I want you to hear my prayer. I want you to see my affliction. And then God, save us. Save us out of their hand. And Lord, not for my honor, not for my kingdom, not for the perpetuation of my little kingdom, but God, I want you to do it. That all these other little countries that serves all them little G-gods that they made out of a piece of wood or a piece of rock, that's just the works of men. God, I want you to do it so they'll know that you're God and there's nobody like you. Boy, I wish I had time to develop it. Hezekiah goes before God, travails with the eternal, and Hezekiah hangs his prayer on three attributes of God. I read it in your hearing a while ago. Number one, he hangs his prayer on the mercy of God. You remember the first thing he said when they got to the house of God? Oh, Lord, the one that dwells between the cherubims. You know where he's at when he prays? He, well, glory. He 
He's coming to an altar. Hallelujah. That's got the blood on top of it. And a Shekinah glory cloud of God resting on that blood-stained altar. It's called the mercy seat. On top of the ark of the covenant, Lord have mercy. You know where this little 25-year-old king is hanging his prayer? God, that cloud that dwells on a blood-stained mercy seat. God, we've come in the power of the blood. God, we've come not to ask for justice, but God, we've come to ask for mercy. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe the God of heaven will move on our behalf if we'll come, not in our name and not in our religious garments, but come pleading the blood and the mercy and the grace of Almighty God. He hangs his prayer on the altar of the mercy of God. Number two, he hangs his prayer on the majesty of God. He said, Lord, you're, not, you're just not the one that dwells between the cherubs. He said, but you're God and you're God alone. Lord, you are God and you're God alone. I am not impressed when I hear a religious leader or a politician talk about the many faiths and the many religions and the many gods. Let me tell you what impresses me. When someone is bold enough to say, we believe in the God and we serve the God who had a son by the name of Jesus Christ who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Can I tell you, he's not a little G God. He's not a figment of the imagination. He's the only God, the only God, the only God who hang the worlds by the power of his might. He hangs his prayer on the mercy of God. He hangs his prayer on the majesty of God. And he hangs his prayer on the might of God. He said, you're not only the one that dwells between the cherubim. You're, not the, you, you, you're just not the only God. But he said, you made it all. You created everything. God, there is nothing beyond your might. I want to tell you something. God has a way of bringing every nation. God has a way of bringing every church. God has a way of bringing every family. God has a way of bringing every preacher. God has a way of bringing every Christian to a dead end place where there is no power other than God's and there is no help other than God's and there is no might other than God's. But I'm not saying that to discourage you. I'm saying that to encourage us that when God is all you've got, he's all you need for he's still the mighty God, the majestic God, the merciful God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever in the house of God. This young man is hanging the hope of his nation and its future on the anchors and the prayers of God's mercies. And I see the threat from the enemy. I see the travail with the eternal. Oh, but here's the end of the story. I see the triumph that was experienced. He pours his heart out to God and says, God, you're all we've got and we are totally trusting in thee. That king walks out of the house of God with that letter and he goes home and does the only thing he can do. Get him a good night's sleep and trust God. And the Bible said that night God sent an angel. Not a bomb, not a horde of soldiers, not even one spear or sword. God sent an angel. In fact, your King James Bible, it's called a theophany, a Christophany. It said the angel of the Lord. Uh, by the way, in the Old Testament, you know who that is, don't you? Not Michael, not Gabriel. Oh, 
in the Old Testament. You know who shows up when the angel of the, oh, it's the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Before he was born of a virgin, he still exists. Before he walked the shores of the Galilee, he still exists. Before he walked on the water, he still exists. By the way, he's the same one that got Lot by the hand and drug him out of Sodom. He's the same one that stood at Jacob's ladder of prayer and said, I'm on your side, son. He's the same one that marched around the walls of Jericho and said, I'm the captain of the Lord's host. He's the same one that showed up under that juniper tree and said, Elijah, I've got goodies from heaven. He's the same one that walked through the fire. He's the same one that walked through the lion's den. He's the same one, amen, that arose from the dead and ascended on high. He's the same one that took Lazarus to the bosom of the Father. I'm telling you, we are not without representation. We are not without representation. We are not without representation. The sovereign, eternal God of the ages can send one angel and take care of business. Can you imagine if the, can you imagine waking up the next morning and Googling that? How did it turn out? Well, we don't know what happened. I know one thing, that king up there, we put him in fear, but we couldn't shake his faith. We told him God wasn't real, but he wouldn't believe us. He prayed to him anyhow. We told him we couldn't trust the preacher, but he asked him to come over and lead him in prayer anyway. We told him going to the house of God was a waste of time, but he went anyway. After he prayed a while, he went home and went to bed and went to sleep. Something happened. He had some kind of secret service or something. Just he had a he had a battalion we we didn't know anything about. Secret service got involved. Man, this angel just come down and went over there and wiped out 185,000. We don't know how it happened, but it's so. Well, what did that little king do that wrote that powerful threatening letter? He went back home to Nineveh. You mean he didn't take over the land? No, he went back home to Nineveh with his head tucked between his legs. Come on now. Why? Because they had an army? No, because they had a God. Why? Because they had military power? No, because they had a God. God won that battle, not in the battlefield, but it was won in the house of God. When a man of God got on his knees and prayed and called out to the God who can do what we cannot do and go where we cannot go and say what we cannot say. You say, preacher, that was thousands of years ago in another time. Yeah, but he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He sure is, Roland, but a mighty God is he. May the 24th through June the 4th, 1940, World War II. The Allies had made a strategic mistake and 300,000 Allied troops are caught and stranded in a little village in France called Dunkirk. Hitler and his evil regime heard about it. They said, tomorrow, we'll put every plane we've got in the air and wipe them off the face of the earth, and we win. They underestimated something. One of the leaders of the free world was a Christian. I hope I didn't offend you by using that term, Christian, named Winston Churchill. And he had England to pray. He sent a message to America, have the people to pray. Now, if you read it in some of the secular history books, they give Hitler the credit for it. They said Hitler listened to one of his subordinate generals and decided at the last minute that it couldn't be done. Let me tell you why he decided at the last minute 
It couldn't be done. Because about 11 o'clock that night, all of Germany was engulfed with a fog. A fog so thick that planes couldn't fly. And England and America and France, you know, we're not all that dumb, you know. You can't fly planes in the fog, but you know what you can do? You can float boats. They got every ship they could find, every merchant ship they could find, every private ship they could find. That fog stayed there for days, almost 10 days. That fog, in a matter of days, 300,000 Allied troops on ships got evacuated. And when the fog was lifted, oh, Hitler said, well, where did they go? And he blamed one of his subordinate generals. You gave me some bad advice. No, I want to tell you what happened. A man by the name of Winston Churchill and some other leaders that believed in the God of the Bible said, in fact, Winston Churchill wrote in his memoirs, it was a miracle deliver." Mm. It was a miracle deliverance that God sent that fog. You say, preacher, has God been known to do things like that? Well, let's see. He rolled back the Red Sea, made the sun stand still, flooded the world, dried up the world, made the world, uh, sends the rain, holds back the rain, uh, speaks in still small voices, rains manna down from heaven, feeds 5,000 men with, uh, and children with five loaves and two small fishes, walks on the water, cleans the leper, raises dead people. Yep, I'd say if God can do all of that, he can send the fog, he can defeat the enemy, not with military power, but the power of prayer can on our knees. Here we go, we're done. And in your family, and in my family, and in your life, and in my life, and in our ministries, and in your ministries, we're going to feel like the enemy is bigger, more powerful, and the threat is so real that if you're not careful, it will shake your faith with fear. But I've come to tell you, do not despair. Grab your family and grab the threat of the enemy and head to the house of the Lord. Bring it to the house of the Lord and bow at an old-fashioned all to a prayer and on the basis of the blood and the mercy of God, cast thy burden upon the Lord. And go to God and go home and get a good night's sleep because God is able to do what we cannot do. In closing this morning, listen to your pastor. I am a true, full-blooded, America. I love my country. And I appreciate the heritage that we've been handed. I appreciate, boy, this, this aggravates some things, but they can't deny it. I appreciate the Christian heritage that we have. Clarence Thomas, when he spoke at Justice Scalia's funeral, read out of the word of God. Romans chapter number five, that the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. I say mega kudos, my friend. And In that seat where that dear man said all around him, pictures of Moses and the Ten Commandments, I thank God for my religious freedom and heritage.
and I'm so thankful for it. I've tried to raise my young ones in the house of God. I've tried to make sure my family stayed in the house of God. And I've tried to call on God in hours of despair. I'm telling you, the God that's ever answered prayer is still the God that answers prayer. If you'll beg for his mercy and plead his blood, he'll answer your prayer. The God I'm preaching about this morning, he feeds children. He clothes families. He pays bills. He supplies needs. He conquers enemies. I'm telling you the power of prayer. We've been given to it. Let's use it for the glory of God.